Welcome to Human Monsters. In this Victim Impact Statement episode, I'm doing something a little different. First, I interview Hannah Butler on her experience of abuse at the hands of her adoptive father and how she has struggled in the aftermath. The second part of the episode is based upon the memoir, Doctor's Orders, by Hannah Wingfield, who also experienced a pattern of horrific sexual abuse as a child. Once again, these accounts take you into the hearts of people who have been damaged by sexual impropriety and details how they have coped as they invest their best efforts to bring about the healing process. Uh, Thank you very much for joining us, Hannah. Thank you for having me, Mr. Morgan. All right, so um, I'd like to go, I'd like to delve first into um, the earliest stages of your childhood before the abuse began. Uh, what kind of circumstances did you, uh, were you born into? Was it a dysfunctional family household or was it a happy situation? Um, I want to say it was kind of both. Um, just for disclaimers, uh, just to start this all off. You know, my the the family I'm going to be talking about, they're actually not my real family. They're actually not in blood related to me. I'm not blood related to them. Um, I'm actually adopted. Um, I'm an international adoption. I became a U.S. citizen when I was 12, but I moved to the United States when I was two. Oh, where are you from? I'm from China. I'm from Guangzhou. Oh, okay. So uh, does is it in the United States where the abuse began? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely, yes. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, describe the transition. It must be quite a culture shock to go from such a uh, such different cultures, such different environments. Uh, what was that like, first of all? Um, I know that I had a little harder time learning English because... I would get um, simple words confused. So usually compound words, a good example would be newspaper. I would say paper news instead of newspaper. My uh, adoptive mom would get very upset with me because, <laughs> you know, uh, she really just wanted me to learn really quickly. But, you know, when you're that age and, you know, you're around a different language, it's it's a bit harder. Um, actually, sure. she said sure. that when I was adopted, a lot of time when she was adopting me, um, I believe the pediatrician in America said that, she believed that I was saying uh, Chinese vowels, you know, because usually it's the vowels that a kid starts off with saying before saying actual words. Well, yeah, it's difficult considering that, you know, the Chinese languages are not, they didn't have their origins in Latin, so there's no similarities whatsoever. Correct, yes. All right, and uh, what other, how, in what other ways was it hard uh, making that transition? And mostly in terms of, uh, integrating into your new family? Um, really not in the family because, to be honest, I didn't really realize I was adopted until I was a little bit older, which is surprising. Um, but I did have a hard time fitting in at school. So when um, I got older, you know, um, I just kind of, like, realized I just didn't really fit in. So actually... Um, I got, I was raised in a very small town called Clyde Park in Montana, and the population was only 280 people. And so with that, it was actually a town that was sell, settled from like one family and, you know, so on and so forth. It was basically like cousins within cousins within cousins hometown. And we were the one of the only families there that were not the OGs, quote unquote, um, because my mom is from Alaska. My dad's from Idaho. So, you know, like they're not even, you know, even close from there. So, um, growing up in that small town was very difficult. I was actually bullied very severely. Um, I battled very bad depression, very bad identi- identity problems, uh, very terrible self-esteem. I still struggle with it. Um, it's crazy because it's been so long since I've been in Montana and it still affects me. But I remember getting teased a lot because, you know, I lived in a white community and with them, you know, They don't see a lot of diversity and um, looking back at it, uh, it was just a really bad town, a very bad environment. Um, I'll get more into it later because it's going to tie into everything altogether. But uh, yeah, it was very difficult living there. Okay. And um, 
Were you uh, were you really abused at home? I mean, aside from the pressures to learn English, was there abuse as well? Yes, I would say on both sides from my mom and my dad. Um, my mom was a bit nicer than my dad per se. Um, she'd be more verbal. Um, she would say things that she shouldn't say, and especially there's a lot more hurtful things, you know, I think that a kid can experience when they're adopted from, you know, their adopted, you know, um, parent. One of the things that she would say to me that always really affected me was, I wish I never adopted you, you know? And I mean, it really hurt to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it would. Uh-huh. What, what was their, their motivation for adopting you? Um, so this also ties into the story as well. Uh, my parents had lost a kid before me. Um, he was only three. He died of cancer. And all, my parents only had boys. We had all boys. And so my mom really wanted a girl, but they did not want to try again to have a baby because health health reasons. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. And um, so uh, describe... Um, the first manifestations of the abuse, what form did they take and who was responsible? Um, my dad, because it, it affected me the most, I I really do believe, uh, more so than my mom. I think my mom kind of grown out of it a little bit because we've, you know, we've talked about it and, you know, she never did, did the stuff my dad did. Um, so for beginners, you know, as I said, my parents lost a son you know, at a very early age with him. And, um, my mom, so this was, so he was actually born a two years before me. All right. Um, when he died, I was alive, but I was not in their family. Right. I was not adopted until 2004. Um, but what had happened was, you know, my mom was a teacher at the time, and she had to quit her teaching job because her son got so sick. And so with that, you know, they didn't have a lot of money from that. And then she had to live in the hospital with him because my dad had to work his job as a construction contractor. So he was always gone on the road. And so just left my mom alone, you know, with her son. And so at that time, you know, it was very difficult. They really didn't have much of a relationship. Um, my mom still had to do her wife duties despite her being so tired and everything. I do know that it got way worse, though, when my brother had passed. And so when my brother had passed, my mom told me that my dad just he he flipped. She said that he did not realize or excuse me, she did not realize how much of a psycho he was and how much of a sick man he was until he died. And um, so some Uh, of the things that really that really uh, came out to her that I guess she didn't really put two and two together until later on, until I told her about everything that's, you know, that's been bothering me, that's happened, you know. Um, so one of the things is that he became a really bad porn addict. Um, he had a he had a um, painter that worked with him. The painter's name was Scott. And Scott... Excuse me? A house painter, you mean? Yes, yes, yeah. because they, you know, they kind of coincide with one another because my dad was a construction contractor. He was a painter, you know. Um, and so with that, this guy, Scott, he actually introduced my dad to porn. Um, he really sensitized my dad to a lot with the porn. And it's usually a case that, you know, porn desensitizes you and it's very addictive. And one of the things is that I don't think my dad distinguished the difference between porn and real life you know what i mean because porn is just acting and i personally know that from my own personal experience because i've done some porn myself and it's not something i enjoy personally and it's not it's, it's just it's just acting was you know, that it's not. was that um for for money or was it just yeah. uh, yes money actually Oh yeah, and so what? Where were you? How how did that come about? Just curious. Um. So I've actually always wanted to be a part of it. I'm I'm not part of it anymore because you know I don't I don't I don't really like it at all. You know, and I don't think mm-hmm. that I should be out there selling my body for that. I don't think that I should be just a body. I think I should be more than just a body. Well, it's interesting because. Because a lot of the men who appear in porn films also don't 
enjoy it as much as they think they're going to as well. Correct. Yeah, I mean they have they have those fluffers on the set, and uh, they find out it's really it's it's like you got to do it now. How it's hard to get aroused on cue, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. And it's just it's just a really icky thing to just get into and just to be a part of. Um, but so that was another thing is that it was the porn addiction. Um, mom said that he he just was really just really disgusting after just you know I guess hanging around Scott and you know um, so it was really my parents that really created the very dysfunctional family. I feel I think my mom was too young to really get married and to ever you know get pregnant. And I think my dad just wasn't ready. I don't think that they, I just wish that they never became one. I just wish that, you know, my, you know, my mom chose someone else, to be honest. And my mom even wishes that too, after hearing everything. Um, Cause she maybe, did say that she realized that he only married her for her looks. And that, that really hurts. Maybe he should have sold his wild oats before getting married. Yeah. I think he did though, because my mom did say that, he had he had a girlfriend before her but i do know that my mom said that with him though his childhood was very abusive um so his mom was a single mom and she got pregnant i think like in her freshman year of college so she was very 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 young but um she got divorced very young too like in less than a year and so you know with that um she went from man to man because she was she was looking for someone to help her with her kids and so with that she um married one man and he actually followed my uncle which is my dad's half brother and they're about six or seven years apart and my dad never gone to detail about this man but he did say that he beat him and you know he never gone to detail with my mom about it either and my mom actually said that i think he sexually abused him because it's not just me that also suffered abuse it was also my brothers but with them being i don't want to say because they are boys they're different you know, because we all are different people. It's not really a gender that classifies that. But I would say that um, uh, they they definitely did deal with some sort of abuse from dad. They just never vocalized it. Did he uh, get into child pornography? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Um, not that we know of. Uh, we just know that he would have a lot of porn magazines and I think this was the start of the destruction of me mentally um that really fucked with my brain was that I remember being three around the age of three and I was I think I was trying to just clean the bathroom and I was going underneath the sink and I found one of his porn magazines I remember just being three and like flipping through it and I was like what is this like this is this is disgusting like but I also remember, like, wanting to try to do it. You know what I mean? Like, it just really fucked with my brain. I don't even know how to even describe it to you. It was, you know, being so young and you're seeing that. And I remember talking to my mom just recently. And I said, you know, you knew about that he was having porn. He had it everywhere in the house and everywhere in the barn. Like, did you ever think that I would see it? And she said, yeah, of course. I was hoping you wouldn't see until you're older. But I also did not know it would have such an effect on you. I think my mom was not very knowledgeable about you know this sort of field with the psychology and what it does you know mm. it was really so you kept finding it all over the house right and you know my mom actually had voiced saying to my dad she did say it wasn't about the porn really but it was about his phone because he had inappropriate things on his phone and she said too you know I don't want her having her phone. I don't want this on your phone. And my dad would just brush it off like, it's not a big deal. It's normal. But it's like, how can you say that, you know? Did he talk about sex and porn-related things around the kids? So, I want to say somewhat, but not really. He would kind of insinuate it. Oh, okay. he, would, yeah, he would insinuate it like a little bit. Um... And so when they actually adopted me, right, they were in China. My mom had voiced that he, um, so he brought the blanket that my brother had, you know, the one who passed away. And he wrapped me in this blanket. And my mom said, Why, what are you doing? Like, you're trying to replace our brand new adopted daughter 
with our dead son. Like, why are you doing that? And my mom said, I didn't want that. I wanted you to be your own person. I didn't want you to be some replacement. But then when I got older, she saw other things too. And I guess she, she didn't put two and two together. And I think the reason why she didn't put two and two together with this abuse and everything was because she didn't want to see dad as that. It just never crossed her mind. I think that sometimes it happens when you know a person for so long that you, and you know you trust them too you just don't you don't see that yeah and so did at some point um i i presume his conduct towards you became inappropriate yes um how old did, would you have been at the time i was about i want to say six or seven i think i was in first grade just going into second grade and I remember, so we had a, we had a teepee outside. Um, and it, my dad actually bought the teepee. He always loved that teepee. He had a bed in it and we'd always like share the bed and just stay there for the night. Right. It, no big deal. Um, one night it was raining. And so dad said, you know, let's just, let's just stay the night in the barn. So we did. And I don't remember how it started, but I remember like if I'm, he was spooning me, I guess you could say. And he he touched me inappropriately, um, you know, down down there. And I didn't know it was bad. You know, I was a very sheltered kid. To be honest with you, I didn't even know what sex really was until I was older. I didn't even know what sex abuse was until I was older. So I I didn't know it was bad, but I know this sounds bad too. Um, but I know that this really fucked with my psyche too, is that I remember I enjoyed it and I didn't know why I enjoyed it. Because I, you know, I was so young, I didn't know what sex was. I didn't know what any of this was. It must so it, on some level, it must have been discombobulating because you had never experienced that before. Correct. And, uh, you know, all other contact was strictly above the waist. I just remember right, and I just remember that it would always be me sitting on his lap. And I remember I was eleven at the time. And my mom came in the room and said, you know, you're too old to be sitting on your dad's lap, which, you know, granted, 11-year-old is, correct? And so um, from there, my mom just thought I stopped sitting on his lap because she told him she's too old for that. But what she didn't know, and that I didn't know was bad, was that he he kept saying, well, come and sit on my lap. When she would leave the room or whatever, where she wasn't around, he'd say, come and sit on my lap or whatever. And you know, I didn't know it was bad because so my dad was a master manipulator and a master gaslighter. So the reason why my mom and I did not have a relationship for so long was mainly because of my dad. My dad brainwashed me into thinking mom was awful. You know, mom was mean. Mom was this. Mom was that, you know. And so he made me, I guess, kind of just believe that I couldn't trust her. So I felt like he kind of just did that. So that something bad happened between dad and me or whatever. I wouldn't go to my mom because I wouldn't trust her. You know how that works? Yeah, yeah. And my mom noted that a long time ago, I think I was like around nine, around that age of nine, 10 or 11. She noticed that dad was like caressing my arm with his hand a bit, running it up and down my arm. And my mom actually tore him apart. And it was a big fight because I, I do remember this fight. I, I really, I kind of do remember this fight because it lasted for like weeks. And I didn't know what it was about um, because my parents would try to always go to the barn to fight. So I never saw how explosive it was. But she did. It was a big fight, she said. And she said that it was over him and what he what, what he was doing with me and the caressing the arm. And she said, you know, you're trying to replace our you're trying to place me with our daughter. And that's oh. that's just so sickening, so disheartening. You know, when you hear that from a parent like that should not be the case. So it was more about her jealousy than it was about what the fact that he was being inappropriate with you. Well, actually, it was not the jealousy. So dad actually made me think it was about jealousy, but it, it, it was not jealousy at all. You know, my mom, she I think she saw certain things like that, that she just didn't put two and two together, which I, I'm, you know, I'm just shocked that she didn't put two and two together, but. She didn't put two and two together to realize, you know, he's he's being a pedophile. He's being a sicko. Mm hmm. Did uh, so did it. Where did it progress from there? From the uh, the touching, the caressing 
um, how, how much further did it go? It never went further than that because, so my dad, when I was in third grade, fourth grade, he started going to the oil field. So he was gone two weeks on, he came back for one week. So it was on and off. But, um, so and then he, he got cancer when I was in sixth grade and then he died when I was in eighth grade. So it really couldn't escalate from there, which thank God it, it couldn't because my mom and I were talking about the what ifs and she said, I don't know if he would have done this, but I do believe that he would have gone to the next step and would have raped you. Oh, God. Yeah. And so we actually, so I don't know about you, but uh, so we're religious. Um, my mom is more religious than me, but she did say that um, God, she does believe that God took him out of our lives because shit would have hit the fan because something probably would have been said from me. But also it, you know, it obviously could have gotten worse. We don't, we don't know. I don't want to know, but. You know, it there's always that possibility. You said and your brothers yes, you said your brothers were abused, but they were were they abused by your father? Yes. Um so the thing with my brothers is that they're actually a lot older than me. So my oldest brother's eighteen years older than me. So I really did not grow up with my brothers. I actually pretty much just grew up as an only child. But my mom, you know, she has voiced what has happened. She did say that my oldest brother, he um I think she said that he started wetting the bed again when he was in fourth grade. And she, she didn't understand why. And I asked her, did you, you know, that that's usually like one of the signs of sex abuse. We, you know, um, and he started hating my dad because he did voice this to my mom saying that he started hating dad when he was in sixth grade. And he doesn't really know. I don't know if he does know why or if he doesn't know why. He didn't voice that with us. My oldest brother's very quiet, um, very private of a person. But we wonder, you know, if dad did touch him. Mm. Um, because it's kind of odd to just all of a sudden start weighing the bed when you're in fourth grade. Because um, that is another sign, you know, of you've been sexually abused. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yep. And, and what, uh, what kind of long-term effects um, was your abuse that, that it's had on you, uh, how does that, how is that manifested? Well, um, so I was, I was always sexualized. That was a problem when I started being sexualized very young. I didn't realize it was sexualization really until I moved on with my own life. Um, I became, well, my mom even voiced this to my dad when I was in fifth grade. And you think about this fifth grade was that I I don't want to say like I dress sexy, but like my mom said, to, she told my dad she's going to be a slut when she grows up. I'm not sure. I, I can't remember what signs I showed that was going to be promiscuous. I mean, my mom said, you know, I expect you to be promiscuous when you're older, but not at that age. And so I don't, I'm not sure what signs she was seeing. I, I don't know. Um, Cause I, I can't remember, <laughs> but she, she did voice that to my dad. She told me this. And, uh, um, I know that I have a hard time with commitment. I have a terrible time with commitment. I have, I I don't know. I just I have, it, commitment's terrible for me. <laughs> and uh, well, did you end up? I know a lot of victims have gone through periods of hypersexualization. Is that what led to the uh, involvement in the adult film industry? Partially, yes. Um, I I never thought I was beautiful you know um i just thought like it'd make me feel beautiful more womanly i i wanted attention from men i wanted just attention in general mm. um and sexual tension is not is not it <laughs> it's yeah. not like are, are you are you in a relationship now no uh i'm not i don't feel like i really can be in relationship to be honest, I think it's it's very difficult for me. I don't know what it is, but I've gotten better. But I feel I don't know. I feel like I can't let down my walls. I don't know what it is. I just can't commit. I don't know why I have commitment issues, but I I do. Well, I mean, it must boil down to an an inability to trust. I I think it is. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of trust issues, and I don't like to admit it, but I definitely. I definitely do. Um, it's been very difficult. Yes. Have you uh, gone in for therapy? 
a little bit, yes, and it's helped. Um, it, it has really helped. Um, but, you know, living where I am now, it's just a painful reminder of Montana because, you know, Montana is a state that has a lot of bad, bad memories for me, um, very painful memories. And where I live is very, um, you know, has a very similar scenery of Montana. What is it? What city do you live in now? Or do you? Uh, I live in Colorado. Oh, you live in Colorado. That's right. But that's yes. a small. That's another small town, Colorado. Where it is? Um, not really. It's a city, but um, I'm only living here temporarily. I actually live in. I actually live in hold residency in Arizona. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes, we moved there when I was uh, 16, and that was a fresh start for me. And that was it was good because my mom knew that I needed to leave because something was you know going on with me mentally, and she knew that we needed to leave. Um, and, and one thing a lot of people have had these experiences end up doing um, is pursuing a, a path of self-destruction, often in the form of substance abuse. Did you ever end up drinking or taking drugs, anything like that? No, um, I was actually never interested in participating in any drugs or alcohol. Um, really, my only quote unquote drug was sex. Um, so I lived in Korea for a year and I was I, I had sex every single day almost and I had a new guy almost every single week oh yeah and it's it's bad so I actually didn't lose my virginity until I was moved out of the house I until I was an adult legally an adult and moved out of the house um I was not allowed to date I was not able to go to any of the proms I was very sheltered and so um, I just, I guess I just let loose, um, a little too much cause it really hurt me in return. Um, but I don't have any regrets if that, if that makes sense. Were any of those encounters fulfilling? I thought so, but I don't really think so. Cause I feel if they were, they would have, they would have lasted. I know I've gotten in some, um, situations that were, uh, that could have really gone downhill for sure. And, and uh, the one thing that, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 go on, go on. Well, I was going to say that one thing that I, I want to note, too, is that I always went for older men, and I don't know why. I've always had an attraction for it. I, I don't know why. I think that's, I, I kind of wonder if abuse had something to do with it. I, I don't know, because I've always went for older men. And, um... I always wanted to interview someone who had been involved in the adult video industry. How do you feel like now that that content is out there? How does that feel? Um, well, it's, uh, I know that when people meet me and, you know, and they find out later on somehow, some way they are, they are shocked for sure. Uh, my mom knows nothing about it. Um, it's I, I, it's hard to say because people today have a different view on it because the OnlyFans and everything. Um, I know that people in Montana who who have seen it or you know who who've, who know about it are definitely shocked. I know that a lot of the people who've seen it are people that I have babysat or that I've known since they were little, or people have known me since I was little. Um, like one of the guys in Montana. So I was somewhat friends, one more acquaintances with his daughter. But he was the basketball coach, and he uh, he uh, he watched he watched my video, and it's I don't even know how to. I was just shocked. I was I don't know, I know how to describe it. Yeah, it's, like it's interesting. In different, yeah, they're seeing you in a different view, you know. Yeah, it's interesting how OnlyFans seems to have almost normalized it at this point. Uh, there's like, you know, just regular women who, you know, are not really in the industry doing it. So it's like it seems to be losing its shock appeal. But I guess when you when someone you knew is doing it, that's different. Correct. Yes. Um, I know that it's not something that I should do. Um, I know that it's it's just not a good industry to be a part of. And I know that if I have kids or something, you know, it's out there. 
um, it will always be out there, and that's that's the very disappointing part. Um, I've watched enough interviews with, you know, former porn stars and their kids seeing stuff, and sometimes they don't make it a big deal, but I think it is because I don't want my kids to be, if I ever have kids, my kids to ever see me in that light or in that way, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I was remembering now that Jenna Jameson has a couple of kids. And, in, you know, it's one thing for your mother to have done it once or twice, but she was the queen of porn. And uh, their friends are going to find out about it. And the videos are all over the Internet. So, I mean, that's what's that going to be like for her kids, you know? Yeah, and I don't want my kids ever, ever to see any of the videos or pictures or anything um i've definitely been threatened of exploitation before definitely absolutely um and it's scary threatened with exploitation well yes um i've had people have well it actually happened when i was 16 i was dating a guy um this is my first boyfriend this is in montana i was i think i was 15 or 16 at the time though and he was he was actually sexually harassing girls and i had no idea about this and how he was doing it was through his his snapchat and he had pictures of me and i was threatening to tell on him and he um he actually posted explicit photos of me on his snapchat story but that that's him exploiting you oh excuse me yes i'm sorry yeah i'm so sorry I mean, that's him being a, a pedophile, basically. I mean, yes. Pederast, yeah. Sorry, I confused those words. I'm sorry, Morgan. Yeah. No, it's okay. Um, and, and you said you mentioned that you were attracted to older men. Were they older white men, too? Uh, yes. I don't know why, but yes, they, they were. Yeah. Um, and what, How'd you know what, they're white? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, you know, the person who kind of introduced you to sexuality, unfortunately, was a man who fit that profile. So, Yes, um, I know that uh, there's always that saying of girls who try to find their husband or boyfriend or whatever usually tend to find someone similar to their dad. But I I really don't want to say that I did that. But I also feel that I kind of did because they're all just pieces of shit. Um, when, When you're involved in the adult industry uh were there a lot of like sleazy people around did you were there people who gave you the the creeps um not really um but i did have one encounter and it was an older man i think he was about 37 so he was quite a bit older than me but he was into really dark stuff and he was into like the i I don't want to say 50 shades of gray but i guess more on the lines of that more or less he was into the fantasy rape and so we did that and it really freaked me out personally just because it was something i'd never done before and you know this guy he was six five and he was like 250 pounds he overpowered me where i I couldn't do anything basically but um he he kind of i don't know i've always had the encounter with these men though is that um, well, not no, well, not just like really an industry, but really uh, just personal too. Because you know, with my one night stands and me having different men, I know that you know I'd see the night, you know, or whatever, and I wake up, you know, and I'm not a big fan of morning sex, but I would say, you know, I don't want to have sex, but they would still do it, you know, like they would start doing it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And it would really well, hurt because I remember the last time it happened. It was with the same guy um, that I was just talking about about from before, um, who's like 37. I I told him no, and he he started doing it. And I said, I told you no. Why are you doing this? And he said, Because I know you want it. I said, No, I don't. I don't want it. I don't want it. But then I ended up enjoying it afterwards. So I don't know. I don't know where that falls into. You know, like what category that is. Well, your father violated your boundaries, so I guess that's, it's like a little too familiar, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know that when I got older, you know, when my dad was still around, I started really hating him, 
Mm-hmm. And my mom could never figure out why I hate him because when he died, I was brainwashed into thinking I missed him because everyone in the town thought he was a good guy. No one knew he was bad. No one knew that he was a piece of shit. And so, uh, you know, being brainwashed, I I thought I missed him, but now being on my own, I, I don't miss him. I don't. And my mom now realizes and now knows why I hate him so much. And I still hate him. And that's, that's sad because I don't like to hate, but I, I really don't like him. I don't like what he did at all. And uh, how do you feel about your mother these days, knowing what she was aware of and how she didn't do anything about it? It's hard because my dad's not the first one. He is the first one who did sexually hurt me, but it was also a childhood friend. So my mom was friends with the woman who lived down the street. And she had three kids. She had a daughter that was in my class, and then she had a son that was two years younger than us. Her son um, sexually harassed me for years and he touched me and his mom knew because he was touching other girls. He allegedly raped an eight year old when he was babysitting her. And yeah, he was 14 at the time. Allegedly, we don't know, but um, because there's no rape, there's no rape kit that was done. But um, she knew about it and she and he still is abusing girls. He's actually now a senior in high school. He's still sexually abusing girls. And, and nobody, it's, it's nobody's, br- nobody's brought that to the attention of the police. So the problem is, is that, so my mom's friend, the woman I'm talking, the mother, she, they actually have a very big ranching name. They have, they have a very big, quote unquote, significant name in the community with their ranch, their cattle ranch and everything. And they don't want to destroy or tarnish their name. So they keep it on, under wraps. And they're easy to get away with it because they built such a quote unquote good reputation. That's only that's the only reason why they've been able to get away with it. And I know that people have wanted to try to press charges or whatever, but they don't have the sources. I don't know if you want to say sources, but they don't have the money for it. It's it's just completely messy because I don't understand. It just it just disgusts me. It does. It makes me so angry. And then as an occurred to the parents to make the guy stop. They have tried, quote unquote, I want to say, I don't really want to say tried because their efforts were just shit. Because what they did was they took away his phone for two weeks. They took away his phone for a few months and then they get it back. It's just ridiculous because he started out small. It was with porn, you know, just like my dad. And then he moved to more physical stuff. It's just, they just didn't give a shit. And it's awful because they're doing such an injustice for him well eventually he will get caught and reported and he'll be serving a lot of time in jail i really hope so because it's just it doesn't make any sense why he's getting away with this and he it did hurt me a lot i know because i know i resented my mom and i still somewhat do um i resented her a lot because I thought she knew about all, and I, she only knew a portion of it. I thought she knew all of it. I, I swear I thought she didn't know all of it, but she only knew a portion. And she, she still, excuse me, remained friends with this woman. And this woman actually is still somewhat in contact with my mom and still wants to be friends with my mom. But my mom, she doesn't really want to have any part in it. Oh, man. Well, yeah, I mean- So it started young from there. And I know that. I was sexualized in my own hometown from older men, not from teenage boys, from older men. Um, my mom was always worried about that. My mom actually said that she had tried to protect me for so long when I was getting older because, you know, she she knew I was going to become a very beautiful girl and a very, I don't want to say easy target, but, you know. Um, but she said, you know, the most disappointing thing, though, is that I tried so hard just to protect you because I was so worried because my mom never got remarried after my dad died because... There's always that likely chance when you date someone or you get remarried that that can happen. Well, it seems and like, so, yeah, it seems like sexual abuse seems to happen at a really high rate in rural areas. Yes, you know, because they're all hush hush. It's so easy to hush hush about it. Yeah. And so with that, though, um, she said the most disappointing thing, though, is that I couldn't even I couldn't even save you from the biggest pedophile, which was your father. Yeah. And so now 
um, since she found out about this, uh, since we both did, you know, kind of just, she, I know that she, I don't even know how to describe how she feels. She's kind of, I don't want to say numb, but she's just like in disbelief almost, but she believes me, but she's also just, she says that it all adds up. It all makes sense because there were certain things that she didn't understand. And now it, it just all makes sense. But she said that, you know, I, I now sit here just questioning my whole life of what the hell did I do? I could have saved you and I didn't, I didn't see these signs. She did see the signs, but she didn't put two and two together. Do you ever um, look back and think I had, a, I had a better life in China? Like what was the reason why you were adopted out? Was, were you, was your Chinese family living in abject poverty or something like that? Um, so they have the one child policy, but they don't really know why I was given up, given up from my birth parents. Um, they're just going to guess that maybe they just wanted to have a better, maybe just wanted me to have a better life. Well, I know that they, uh, they have what's called the little emperor syndrome where they preferred boys. And so there's yes. a long period where they were constantly uh, adopting out girls. I don't think they're doing it anymore. I think at this point. It's only, they're just adopting out like disabled kids. But I remember in the late nineties, uh, like reading a Canadian newspaper and this, this judge approved adoptions for like this huge group of Chinese girls. So yeah, that's, that's a big thing with third world adoptions yes. was that pre preference for boy uh, right. adopting out There's girls. So many, yeah, so many possibilities. And I know that I'm definitely a victim of, Asian fetish fetishism is that, is that a word? I don't yeah, know some people it. some people call it yellow fever. Yeah. Yeah, I well, I'm trying to talk professionally here yeah. and not call well, it that. You don't you don't have to talk professionally. <laughs> but yes, uh, yellow fever. That's a good way of putting it. But yes, um, in, in Montana, yeah, I didn't realize that until um, I was really older. Um, but yeah, I was definitely, and I still I still am because when I try, you know, to meet new men or whatever the question is what what's your what's your race and i'm like why do you need to know what my race is why does that matter yeah was that um, the was that the category of, of video you were doing um somewhat yes because uh it'd always be like in the bio i know that that's something that somewhat sells I'm going to be honest with you. Were you offered more opportunities along those lines? Um, I wouldn't say more opportunities, but I did get more attention. So how does that feel like when you're objectified based on your race? Was that a hard thing, pill to swallow? Yes, because sometimes I kind of wonder if I was white and blonde or whatever. Would you, would you want me? Would you think I'm pretty still? Would you, you know, whatever, would you care? Would I be treated better? There's a lot of things that I, I question. That was it. Uh, did it have a dehumanizing effect, like an objectifying effect? Somewhat, yes. But I, I kind of feel like maybe that's all I'm good for. I hate to think that, but sometimes I just feel like the all I'm just good for. So you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, you have trouble with trust and commitment when it comes to relationships. Do you have, I mean, do you ever, do you ever wish that you could have a long-term relationship in the future? Yes, absolutely. I'm getting a little bit older. Yep. And do you want to get married someday? Hello? Hello? Yep. Can, can you, do you hear me? Yes. Sorry, I lost signal there. Oh yeah. Do you do you hope to get married someday? Absolutely yes. And I'm you know I'm getting a little bit older, and so yeah, of course. You know I just want a normal life. Do you want to have kids of your own? Uh, to be honest, I don't think so. Um, no, I don't think so. But you and, know uh, things happen. Yeah. What kind of career goals do you have in mind? Well, actually, I'm working to become a doctor. Oh, that's great. Congratulations. Yes. How's that coming along? It's coming along very well. Um, I'm not paying any expenses. Uh, college is basically free for me. Oh, so you're, you're in a medical school now? 
Uh, actually, no. I'm actually close to getting my bachelor's degree, but I'm very, um, very far along, actually. In less than a year, I was already in my senior year. Oh, nice. Congratulations. Yes. Did you, did you have a specialty in mind? I'm sorry? Did you have a specialty in mind, a specialty in, in medicine that you wanted to, to pursue? Well, actually, uh, I'm not going to become a medical doctor, really. I'm going to become a speech-language pathologist. Oh, okay. And what interested what interests you about that? What uh, sparked that one? I've always been interested in how speech impediments work. Um, I just, it, you know, works along with the mind as well. So I like to study that. I like to read about it. Um, I didn't realize that until I was older and I took a career exam of, like, you know, what career would fit me best. I read that one would. Yeah, it seems like a lot of speech impediments are triggered by emotional responses, actually. Uh, yeah. Like social anxiety. Did you ever develop anything like that as a result of your abuse? Like when you encounter a man who's much older, much bigger in size, does that trigger any uh, anxiety in you? I don't really think so. I think sometimes maybe how he looks. Honest. Yeah, yeah. Which you shouldn't base it on looks, but you know, uh, looks I think kind of you know make me think or feel something different, you know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, thank you very much for sharing your story today. And I know it can't be easy to talk about. But uh, I hope it uh, makes, perhaps it gives you some peace in order, in order that uh, you've gotten it off your chest. And uh, yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, best of luck for you in your future as a doctor. Thank you. I really appreciate that, Morgan. All right. Take care, Hannah. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. You too. Bye-bye. 1978. Hannah was five years old. She lived with her mother and grandmother in the town of Yorkshire, England. She was an only child. She never knew her father. Regardless, the first few years of her childhood were marked by domestic bliss, with the trio of women enjoying their harmonious relationships. Hannah was fortunate to have a loving mother and an equally loving grandmother, the latter of whom baked, knitted, and engaged in all sorts of other grandmotherly pastimes. It was an idyllic environment for a girl to spend her early childhood. 1980. Hannah was now seven years old. After a pleasant birthday, misfortune befell Hannah's life. She began to experience health complications. She began to overeat, yet she lost weight. She also experienced bouts of fatigue which would result in her being short of breath and unable to participate in the kind of physical activity that was customary in her school's physical education program. These symptoms continued to worsen. Her mother tried to treat them herself, but whatever Hannah's condition was, it was untreatable by anyone without a medical background. It was time to see the doctor. At the time, Hannah's doctor was a woman she referred to as Dr. Emily. She remembered her fondly as a warm and friendly sort. After examining Hannah, she brought her mother over to a corner of the room where they had a hushed conversation. When they returned to their previous positions, Hannah's mother told her that she would have to be a brave girl because a blood sample would need to be taken. After the blood was withdrawn, Hannah was given a lollipop. What more could a girl want from a doctor? A week later, Hannah's doctor called and reported her findings from the blood sample. Whatever the diagnosis was, it seemed to worry her mother. Her mother called Hannah's school and told the office that she would be late due to a medical issue. She sat Hannah down at the breakfast table and explained that she had a condition called hypermetabolism. Simply put, the qualifying criterion for this diagnosis is an overactive thyroid gland, 
under these circumstances, it produces an excessive amount of thyroxine. As a result, the body burns calories faster than they can be ingested. If the patient goes untreated, death cannot be ruled out as a prognosis. Throughout the following weeks, Hannah underwent a battery of blood tests and other diagnostic protocols. She began taking medication daily to manage the condition. It was called carbimazole, and she would have to take it for two years. She experienced an improvement in her medical outlook within two weeks. Eventually, she gained back the weight she lost, and her energy levels were restored to those of a typical seven-year-old female. Five months later, Hannah, her mother, and grandmother were about to embark on a vacation. They were all feeling good, with Hannah's health being restored to its former robust condition, and her mother and grandmother having had recently celebrated birthdays. Her grandmother wanted to reward Hannah for being so brave during the medical treatments by taking her on this trip. Shortly before the date of their departure, her grandmother received a call from the medical center where Hannah had been treated. The receptionist informed her that Hannah would no longer be treated by her current physician. Henceforth, she would be under the care of one Dr. William Seckford. Her mother and grandmother had never heard of this doctor. They assumed he must be new. Hannah was deeply disappointed. She liked her Dr. Emily so much, she cried as she contemplated her new relationship with a new practitioner. She wondered why this man was brought in. She wondered what he would be like. The next day, Hannah and her mother went to the clinic to meet this Dr. Seckford. When they were introduced, he shook her mother's hand and knelt to Hannah's level, whereupon he put his arm around her shoulder. He came across as sincerely pleased to meet her. He brought them to the examination room. They asked about the departure of Dr. Emily. All he said was that she left due to family matters. Otherwise, he claimed to know nothing about it. Seckford soon came at Hannah with a barrage of personal questions. Hannah wasn't sure about his trustworthiness, so her answers were terse. He could have gleaned all that information by reading her file, which would no doubt have been updated before Dr. Emily departed. She noticed that the toys in a corner of the room were all oriented toward female children. Her previous doctor's toys were more gender neutral. He asked her if she wanted to play with them. She responded to the affirmative, and this seemed to please him. He asked her mother several questions. As he did so, he would occasionally look over at Hannah, as if including her in the conversation simply by acknowledging her presence. She wasn't interested in being included in their exchange. She just wanted to play with the toys. He and her mother really hit it off, even cracking jokes back and forth. By the end of the visit, Hannah came to like him a little. With that, she and her mother left the clinic. A few days later, Hannah's mother received a phone call, one that was very unexpected. He was the receptionist from the clinic. She informed her that Dr. Seckford wanted to see Hannah first thing Monday morning. This struck her mother as odd. Hannah hadn't been experiencing a relapse in her condition. There didn't appear to be any necessity in undergoing another checkup. However, people have a tendency to trust doctors to a degree that they invariably take them at their word. After all, they're the ones who spent years in school to obtain that position. They must know what they're doing. The receptionist didn't explain why Dr. Seckford felt it was important for Hannah to return to the office, only stating that it was important. Normally, they only went to the clinic on a monthly basis, but her mother agreed to bring Hannah to the office on Monday morning. A change came over her mother when in Dr. Seckford's presence. Viewed through the prism of hindsight years later, she realized that her mother was very taken with Seckford. 
During this appointment, Hannah was not invited to play with the toys. He apologized for calling them in again so soon after the last appointment, but he came across as gravely concerned. He told her mother that he felt Hannah was underweight. While weighing her, his suspicions were confirmed. Oddly, this seemed satisfactory to him. No doctor should be happy that their patient is experiencing malignant symptoms of any kind. Hannah's mother was puzzled. Dr. Emily was satisfied by Hannah's weight gain. Why was it so concerning to Dr. Seckford? Seckford apologized but offered no explanation. There was no scientific method to his madness. But Hannah and her mother were ignorant of this fact. Dr. Seckford proposed a solution. Instead of adjusting Hannah's dis... Instead of adjusting Hannah's dosage of medication, he would employ massage techniques. He argued that they would help Hannah relax, and with the release of tension, homeostasis, or balance, would be achieved. He insisted that her body would function with greater efficiency if she were to receive massages on a regular basis. He said that even a high-calorie diet would not restore her weight. He kept selling them on massage as the ideal remedy. He asked her mother if he could demonstrate the massage technique on Hannah so she would know how to, to approach it at home. Her mother was confused by this, but she gave her consent. Seckford gestured to Hannah to approach him. When she did, he instructed her to remove her school cardigan. She was reluctant. She looked over at her mother, unsure if it was appropriate. Her mother nodded. Having removed the cardigan, Hannah was nervous. He put his left hand on her shoulder. He told her there was no need to be afraid, that it was being done to restore her health to its previous condition. She did not feel reassured by his words. He asked her to remove the last few bottom buttons of her shirt because he wanted to see her stomach. She did as she was instructed. He told her mother to pay close attention so she would know what to do. Following this, he asked Hannah to stand up as straight as possible and to face away from him. With his left hand, he reached around her waist and pulled her shirt up out of the way. He maneuvered his right hand around and over her stomach, whereupon he covered it with his palm. Hannah felt uncomfortable with this. It was strange. She flinched. She had never been touched in this way, not even by a doctor. He rubbed her stomach in a circular formation around her navel. It went on for a minute, but to Hannah it seemed to go on forever. He told her mother that massaging her stomach would result in a slowing of her circulation in that area, which would reduce the speed of digestion. While her mother asked questions about the procedure, he kept his hands planted firmly on Hannah's stomach, occasionally stroking it with his fingertips. Hannah was now more uncomfortable than ever, and she tried to pry herself loose from him. His hand would pull her back into position. Her mother didn't notice what was really going on because she was so infatuated with Seckford. Seckford introduced another technique. He turned Hannah around to face him. With his left hand, he pulled her shirt higher than before, with her lower back exposed to a greater degree. He placed the hand on her lower back, spreading his fingers and pressing his fingertips in a pulsating, circular motion, imprinting deeply. She came to enjoy the sensation. He explained that this technique helped to release tension in the body, cut down on stress, and conserve energy. His hand traveled down towards her skirt, and he ran his fingers around to the front, along the waistband. He slid his fingers down beneath the waistband, briefly to the point that he made contact with the elastic band of her panties. Her mother was so enraptured with Seckford 
that she didn't notice when Hannah flinched and gasped. Seckford asked Hannah to sit down for the next stage of the demonstration. This was the most intrusive phase. She was facing her mother this time. Her mother didn't seem to think there was anything remarkable about the fact that he gently pushed up the hem of Hannah's skirt to expose the skin on her thighs, just above the knees. He asked her to remove her left shoe, and she did. He grabbed her left ankle and rested the other on her thigh, just above her knee. He lifted her foot up to knee level. He claimed that by applying pressure to her thigh with his right hand and pulling with the other, one could release tension in the lower half of her body, and therefore she could reap many benefits, as with the other techniques. He gave her mother a review of what he demonstrated while never taking his hand off Hannah's thigh and brushing his little finger against her outer thigh every few seconds. At one point, his hand creeped up the hem of her skirt, and he moved his thumb over her inner thigh. Hannah was frozen with fear. And then abruptly, it stopped. Hannah dressed hurriedly. Before she and her mother left, Seckford advised her mother to apply the massage techniques he demonstrated every morning without skipping a day. When he saw them off, he put his arm around Hannah and told her everything was going to be okay, after which he gave her some candy. These gestures did nothing to put her at ease. Hannah knew nothing about sex and inappropriate touching at the age of seven. She was afraid to tell her mother that she was uncomfortable about the way Dr. Seckford touched her. It was clear her mother thought the world of him and would not stand to hear such allegations. So, Hannah kept it to herself. A week later, Hannah had another appointment with Dr. Seckford. She was almost nauseous with dread. He weighed her and told her that there was no improvement in her weight. He asked her mother if she had been applying the massage techniques to Hannah on a daily basis. She said she had, and it was true, but Seckford was skeptical that her mother was applying them as directed. He asked her if, if he could demonstrate the techniques for her again. To Hannah's horror, she said yes. Hannah took the tack of telling them both that she was feeling ill as a means to avoid the demonstration. They didn't believe her. Her mother was embarrassed and impatient for Hannah to become compliant. Seckford said that if Hannah was feeling nauseous, it was because she wasn't digesting her food properly and therefore needed more help with her metabolism. She couldn't shout him down so she was helpless to accept his hands on her once again. However, this time was different. This time, he went further. It was a two-pronged demonstration as before. During the first demonstration, he held up her shirt and his hand crept higher and higher, to the point that he was lifting it to chest level. He stroked her skin along the way at the epidermal level, with little to no muscular contact. When he delved into the back demonstration, he placed his hand much lower than before, just above her buttocks. His other hand was exploring her back. Once again, Hannah was paralyzed by fear. Letting him touch her in this manner left her imbued with self-loathing. He went into the leg demonstration. He applied the same techniques as before, but this time, when he passed his hands over her inner thigh, his hand edged dangerously close to her groin. His hand was replete with perspiration. When she looked up at him, the lascivious expression on his face shocked and terrified her. Without going into specifics, his darkest carnal desires normally obscured within the deepest depths of his psyche, 
that place that usually remains hidden beyond one's pupils, was all over his face, and more frightening than any Halloween mask. This monster was not something that emerged from a f work of fiction. He was far too real. Once this session was over, Hannah dressed. She felt dirty. She wondered why Sackford was touching her that way. She also wondered why her mother failed to recognize that sexual impropriety was underway right in front of her face. He insisted that her mother apply the massage techniques every day and that she follow the proper form. It's purely speculative. But Hannah wondered if her mother applied the techniques with a half-assed effort so that she could see Seckford more often. During the next appointment, Hannah was weighed and after a weekend of eating pastries baked by her grandmother, she gained a few pounds. Hannah was elated. Dr. Seckford was underwhelmed by this news. He said that though the weight gain was encouraging, he still needed to examine her abdomen to check on the function of her digestive organs. He emphasized that any abnormalities in their processes would indicate a relapse in her condition. He took her mother over to the corner and they had a hushed conversation. When her mother came back over to Hannah, she explained that Seckford needed to examine her without her mother in the room. Hannah was deeply upset by this. The last thing she wanted was to be alone with this creep. She told her mother that the prospects of being alone with him scared her, though she couldn't bring herself to tell her why. Her mother told her she was being silly, that she was a big girl and he was a nice man. Hannah was given no say in the matter. Seckford instructed Hannah to walk to the corner and remove her shoes. Then he told her to take off her socks. He unbuttoned the bottom half of her shirt and pulled her skirt down. He picked her up by the waist and placed her on a couch. He knelt and inspected her feet, passing his fingers lightly over the soles, which tickled. His hands advanced to the back of her calves and slowly inched upwards. They gingerly squeezed the muscles on the back. He looked at her to ascertain her feelings on these actions. She took on a poker face so that he wouldn't get whatever reaction he hoped for. After passing his hands over her knees, he passed them over her thighs. He squeezed them and pulled them apart a little. He caressed the skin on the inside of both thighs. She wished it would end there, but it appeared he was only getting started. He pushed her back on the couch. He swung her legs up and twisted her body around so that she was lying flat on her back. Her breathing was labored and her heart was pounding. Perhaps observing this, he stroked her hair to calm her. He whispered to her, saying that if she relaxed, it would end sooner and it would never happen again. Accepting this as truthful, she willed herself to relax. With his left hand on her right thigh, he squeezed it as he placed his right hand on her abdomen. He pressed and probed gently. He slid his fingers down to the elastic of her panties. This time, he slid them beneath the elastic band, moving them around under the fabric as they made their way toward her vagina. This was more than Hannah could tolerate. She panicked and cried out. Her mother was still in the room, but her view was obscured. She rushed over to Seckford and asked what was wrong. He said he was a little too heavy-handed when touching her bowels, and didn't mean to hurt Hannah. He announced that the treatment was over and they could leave. When Hannah bent over to retrieve her skirt, Seckford cupped and squeezed her buttocks. Hannah was mortified. Within seconds, 
Hannah began to cry uncontrollably. Her mother asked her what was wrong. Once again, Hannah couldn't bring herself to tell her mother what Seckford was up to. He told her mother that it was normal for children to react that way to such a treatment. She swallowed his words, keen as she was, to swallow anything that was issued from any orifice of Dr. Seckford. Seckford told them that he saw no sign of concern during the examination and that he was sure Hannah's bill of health would continue to improve. This was true of her physical body. As for her mental health, that was another matter entirely. Hannah's mother's infatuation with Dr. Seckford drove a wedge between mother and daughter. She still loved her, but with her mother's eagerness to accommodate Seckford's every whim, it was hard for her to trust her. Hannah still wanted to tell her about the inappropriate ways in which Seckford touched her, but ultimately Hannah didn't want to think of him at all. Another appointment with Seckford. After weighing Hannah and asking the usual preliminary medical questions, Hannah was dispatched to the toy bin so he could talk with her mother. For a change, Seckford's words were pleasing to Hannah. He announced that he was satisfied with her bill of health, homeostatic as she was. He went on to say that he would only need to see her on a monthly basis, as opposed to the weekly schedule. She was overwhelmed with relief. Seckford and her mother had connected on a whole new level. Again, Hannah would realize years later that it was her mother who wanted to be touched voluntarily by Seckford. With Seckford's presence having become reduced to 12 visits a year, Hannah now felt more confident. Her confidence and zest for life were restored to their previous levels. A change came over her mother at that time, too. She was spending far less time at home. She was often distant when she was home. One night when she came home attired with a big smile, fastened firmly and extending from ear to ear, she announced that she had something very important to tell Hannah and her grandmother. She confessed that she had been lying about where she had been during her absences and who she was with. She wasn't with friends. She was dating. The man she was dating... Dr. Seckford. In fact, as of that very day, they were officially a couple. Though she was careful to keep it to herself, Hannah was devastated. Her mother couldn't have possibly chosen a worse man for a boyfriend. Hannah's grandmother wasn't entirely as thrilled as her daughter. She called Seckford's ethics into question. Surely it is frowned upon when a physician becomes sexually involved with his patients. Overall, she wasn't impressed, but after asking Hannah's mother several questions, she retired to bed. Hannah wasn't quite as primed for a night of restful slumber. She felt angry, hurt, and betrayed. Even worse, she didn't have the temerity to tell her mother why she felt that way. Her mother, perhaps sensing that Hannah was only upset by the upheaval that the situation proposed, went over to Hannah to comfort her. She hugged her. She went into detail about what it was she liked so much about him and how they would all have so much fun together with him as an added party in the near future. Hannah was far from sold on this. Her mother also told her that men would never come before her, but Hannah found that hard to believe. Her mother had been less accessible to her during the time when Seckford was courting her. Hannah began to cry. Her mother asked her why she was so distressed. Hannah still couldn't confront her about Seckford's conduct in the medical office. She told Hannah to go upstairs and get ready for bed whereupon she would read her a story. Hannah declined the story. 
The only story Hannah wanted to be told that night was the one she could tell about the perverted doctor and the seven-year-old girl he molested. She wanted to tell this bedtime story to her mother, but she felt like it would be unfair to her since she was happy than she'd been in years. All the confidence Hannah had regained was obliterated. Now Seckford would invade her life like never before. The next day, while Hannah was eating her breakfast, her mother announced that Seckford was due to visit for lunch. Hannah would never be ready for his visits, but this was too soon. She was not prepared. It was less than 24 hours after her mother announced that they were an item. How would she keep her meal down? He came armed with flowers and a bottle of wine. Her grandmother warmed to him after their introduction. However, he was especially focused on Hannah. She occupied a special place in his crosshairs. Much to her dismay, she wound up sitting next to Seckford as they ate, within striking distance to be exact. She knew that protesting about this arrangement would only incur her mother's embarrassment and wrath. Her grandmother interrogated Seckford throughout the meal while her mother lavished compliments upon him. Hannah didn't say a single word to him after hello. Hannah lost her appetite before she could eat a single morsel. This attracted Seckford's attention. He announced that she wasn't eating. He went on to say that she was special and brave. Meanwhile, his right hand drifted over to her left thigh. He squeezed it gently. From there, he went on to squeeze it harder and harder. When he wasn't doing this, he was stroking her thigh upwards and downwards. When he brought his hand upwards, he pushed it beyond the hem of her skirt. Hannah was frozen with fear. She closed her legs firmly, but he forced his fingers between them, pressing them through so deeply that he nearly made contact with her vagina. Having had his fun, he withdrew his hand abruptly. Once Hannah's fear faded, she ran upstairs to her bedroom. The process of grooming children for sexual abuse often starts with the parents. The abuser gains their trust and eventually moves on to the children. Seckford was playing the long game, and for now, he was winning. Hannah's mother was very angry with Hannah for having been so quiet and departing from the table with, with such haste. Her mother and grandmother, on the other hand, had been charmed by him. To Hannah's relief, most of the time her mother spent with Seckford was nocturnal, late night drinks after work, most importantly, elsewhere. The next time Seckford visited their home, it was on a Saturday at lunch. That time, Hannah went out of her way to ensure that she would sit across from him. He kept asking her questions, but she stonewalled him. He appeared to be frustrated with her, most likely because he didn't get to have his way with her. At one point, Hannah got up and went to the downstairs bathroom. Once she was finished, she opened the door and was shocked to find Seckford standing there. He was blocking access to the stairs. Her heart was racing. All she wanted was to go upstairs and be left alone. Now not only could he touch her, but he could do it in ways that would not require a furtive approach. He didn't say anything. He just stared at her with an intensity that could have melted paint off the walls. Hannah tried running past him, but it was in vain. He refused to budge. She brushed past him anyway, but he stuck out his arm and made contact with her body. He slapped her in the buttocks, this time with more aggression. She continued her ascent up the stairs. She heard the sick laughter of a sadist 
as she reached the main floor of the house. He visited the following night. Hannah remained upstairs for most of the evening, but eventually she became parched and went to the kitchen to get a beverage. As she poured herself a drink, the creep came up behind her, bent down to her level, and hugged her from behind. He kissed her on the cheek. He whispered to her that he loved her and said that she must not tell anyone. When he stood, he grabbed her shoulders and pulled her against his body. She felt his erection pressing into her back. He held her in that position for a moment that felt like an eternity. And then he departed as abruptly as he arrived, whereupon he left the room. He seemed to be inescapable. She tread lightly down the stairs and carried out her journey from A to B from her bedroom to the kitchen with stealth every step of the way. Ultimately, he could detect her presence. Ultimately, he could detect her presence with every sensory function known to man. When it came to Hannah, he could hear and see with laser-like precision. The weekend visits became routine. He seldom had her mother over to his home. He always wanted to visit her, and the reason for it was obvious. It was all about Hannah. Every time he visited, he would corner her and touch her. The strokes, the squeezes, the fondling. She hated it all. It was also chilling that this man she barely knew told her he loved her. That sentiment was inappropriate in and of itself. He began buying her gifts, most likely to buy her silence. A change came over Hannah. She was now introverted and somewhat reclusive. She didn't spend as much time with her mother and grandmother. She became temperamental, becoming disputative with her teachers and classmates, with little provocation on their part. She didn't treat her friends very well either at that point, and social invitations dried up. She was depressed, anxious, and derived little pleasure from the aspects of her life she used to enjoy. Her academic performance suffered as her ability to concentrate on her studies diminished. She was eating less than usual. Seckford increased the dosage of her medication. Seckford had invaded her home, her body, and her soul, and the situation would see no improvement any time soon. Three months after her mother started dating Seckford, he began spending entire weekends at their house. The notion that he would be on the premises overnight terrified her. The first Saturday that he spent the night, she shut her door. She hoped that with her door closed, he would assume that the room and its occupant were off limits. The message had not been received, or if it had, it was disregarded. She woke to find that her bed linens had been lifted, exposing the lower half of her body. Her door was left ajar, and her lamp was on. She didn't see anybody. She assumed that her mother had been checking up on her. She got up, closed the door, and returned to bed. Sunday night... Hannah woke and detected that someone was leaving her room. Whoever they were, they disappeared by the time she got a look. Her nightdress had been pushed up. This was not something her mother had done or ever would do. She was too afraid to shut the door and found it difficult to get back to sleep. Two weeks later, Hannah sensed someone's presence in her room late at night. She caught a glimpse of Seckford as he was leaving. He was clad only in a t-shirt, the lower half of his body naked and exposed. When Hannah repositioned herself on the bed, she felt a wet spot on the sheets. 
next Saturday. Sometime after Hannah went to bed, she woke when her breathing became labored. Someone was pinning her to the bed. A hand was planted over her mouth. The room was dark, and the door was closed. The covers had been pushed away. Her nightdress had been pushed up to her waist. She could smell Seckford's trademark aftershave. He was naked. He pushed her legs apart, as widely as possible. He installed his legs between them to keep them spread. Hannah began to struggle and tried to scream. She felt his hot breath by her ear. She chafed against his stubble. He whispered into her ear to be quiet. He told her he was doing something that would make her feel better. He told her she would learn to enjoy it. She was petrified. Her heart was racing. She struggled more and more to breathe with his hand over her face. He slid his left hand under her nightdress. He ran it over her chest. He rubbed her nipples roughly. He began to groan. He was pawing her chest with so much aggression it began to cause her pain. He moved the hand down to her vagina. He cupped his hand over it. He pressed it. He stroked it. He put a finger inside. He pushed it in and out several times. It was exceedingly painful and caused her to cry out. She tried harder than ever to wriggle free from him, but this gesture elicited no mercy from him, for he inserted a second finger inside her. He opened the two fingers wider, spreading the orifice apart, which was even more painful. He told her to relax, that it wouldn't hurt as much if she relaxed, which would lead to her enjoying it. She became compliant in hopes that it would soon stop. He kissed her on the forehead and told her she was a very good girl. He continued to violate her with his fingers. After a moment of this, he pushed his erect penis inside of her. The pain was horrific. It felt like she was being torn apart. She began crying, weeping, sobbing. Again, this elicited no sympathy from Seckford as he continued raping her. He would intermittently whisper things she couldn't understand. At some point, he laughed. He planted more of his weight on her, making it even harder for her to breathe. He thrusted faster. The pain grew more intense, spreading throughout her abdomen. His vocalizations were just as disturbing as everything else. He ejaculated inside her and groaned as he pulled out and became relaxed. Hannah was anything but relaxed. In fact, she screamed. She screamed bloody murder. He tensed up again and placed his hand over her mouth. He pinned her to the bed to restrain her. He told her that what she did was stupid, that it would make everybody else angry for waking them up. Then he told her he was only trying to help her, and he loved her very much. There was a commotion downstairs. He didn't move. He remained on the spot with his hand over Hannah's mouth. Seconds later, they heard the sound of someone running upstairs. He panicked and scrambled around the dark in search of his clothes. Hannah's mother burst into the room. At that point, he had only managed to put his t-shirt on. Her mother put two and two together, and soon the disbelief and shock of what she saw overtook her. She went into a rampage, screaming at him and demanding an explanation. He had no excuse to give her, only apologizing profusely. 
He raised his arms in surrender. He was as shocked as she was that he had gotten caught committing an act of unspeakable abuse. Her mother went to the bed and held Hannah tightly. She was on the verge of tears herself as she pulled Hannah's nightdress down. She cradled her and kissed her. She was shaking with rage and distress. As Seckford retrieved the rest of his clothes, he continued to apologize to her mother without explaining why he did it. Her mother jumped up from the bed and slapped him in the face as hard as she could. She grabbed him by the arms and pulled him out of Hannah's room. She screamed at him, telling him he was a monster and to get out of her house. He went into the bathroom and locked himself inside. Hannah's mother came back into her bedroom and collapsed beside her on the bed. Her grandmother came into the room to see what was going on. Her mother told her to call the police and tell them that he had raped Hannah, though she didn't use those exact words in front of her. Hannah's mother stayed with her when the police arrived. They had to break the bathroom door down to arrest Seckford. When they dragged him out, he was curled over and bashful, making no eye contact. Hannah never saw him again. Hannah spent the next week in hospital. A rape kit was carried out and she was treated for internal injuries. She was doped up on pain medication. She received some counseling, which helped give her some peace of mind. She recounted all the incidents of abuse to her mother detail by detail, and her mother conveyed this information to the police. Seckford pleaded guilty. During his sentencing hearing, he took advantage of an opportunity to make a statement. He claimed to feel deeply ashamed and would never be able to forgive himself for the ways in which he caused Hannah and her family to suffer. He still refrained from offering an explanation for why he felt compelled to abuse Hannah as he did. The judge wasn't convinced of Seckford's sincerity. He said that he abused his position as a doctor in the most appalling way imaginable and only stopped when he was caught. He called him a cunning and calculating man who took advantage of someone who was vulnerable and weak. He sentenced him to nine years in prison. Four months into Seckford's sentence, he committed suicide by hanging himself in his cell. Hannah's mother was outraged. This was not justice. He deserved those nine years of punishment. She considered it the coward's way out and blamed the prison system for not monitoring him closely enough. Initially, Hannah felt confusion and relief. This gave way over time to guilt and shame. She felt she was to blame for his death. These feelings would plague her for years. Hannah, her mother, and her grandmother never recovered entirely from the incident. Her mother took to substance abuse to cope with the aftermath, drinking heavily and smoking cigarettes. Eventually, her grandmother sold the house so that they could put a physical distance between themselves and the incident. They all needed a fresh start. Still, none of them found any happiness. Her mother died at the age of 37 from the damage incurred by heavy drinking. Hannah established a career as a veterinary nurse, a position she greatly enjoyed. She sought comfort and healing in her Christian faith. She met a man and their relationship evolved into a romance. They are now married. These are aspects of Hannah's life Seckford could not destroy. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.